Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 26, 2016. This is a week in charts. Brought to you by Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters. BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. And, of course, by me. Every week I say I need to create this, uh, update this graphic. I guess it's getting kind of a, uh, it's no longer a new year, but so far it has come true. It's been kind of a bumpy year in the markets. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? For some reason, I woke up this morning thinking of how trading is not exactly a game of exacts and, and how perfection, uh, perfectionist, he tried to say, need not apply. And I guess the reason I thought that is because I've been getting a lot of questions asking me uh, very specific things and wanting to deal uh, with exacts. And these are these are some, some are recent and some are not so recent, but these are a few that I thought of and a few that were in my inbox uh, recently. Uh, where exactly would you turn bullish? Exactly where should I place my stop? Exactly how many days should a pullback have? Exactly how much should a stock pull back? What exactly should the HV be? Exactly how long should I wait after the open before exiting in, let's say, a damage control situation? Exactly how much wiggle room should I use for the entry? And when taking profits on a near miss, exactly how close does it have to be? Now, I got to thinking about each one of these questions and a few more, and I started to put together a examples and explanation of each one. And then I realized that I've already done that through many and many shows. So I will touch upon quite a few things today, but things like where exactly should I place my protective stop? I did two shows on that alone. So we're not gonna answer these questions exactly today, but I do want to talk in generalities. And then um, I had one more in here. Exactly how many days does it take for a market to be considered trending? Okay. Now, when it comes to markets, you have to realize that you're dealing with an emotional being made up of a lot of emotional beings, okay? And one of which, by the way, is you. So one thing I like to do to wrap my head around markets is to think about my own personal psychology. Um, this morning, just this morning, I dropped an F-bomb, and then I realized I was dropping an F-bomb, and I was like, okay, well, a little while later, when something went against me, um, as I've said before, I kind of use a different kind of um, mode. Or when I catch myself being aggravated, I'll say things like, well, is it that interesting? Or if it's going against me, like earlier, I'll make like the, the trombone with the mute sound, you know, womp, 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 womp. And I know it sounds silly, but that's my way of wrapping, a head, my, wrapping my head around it and dealing with the stress. So you have to realize that the market is a very imperfect thing. And the more people are perfectionists in their own life, and that's why I said perfectionists need not apply. And a lot of people have to be perfectionists. If you're a brain surgeon, you've got to be pretty precise in what you're doing. I was a Logic chip designer in my past life. How's that for baggage? Michael, that's uh, that's pretty serious baggage. Um, and, and it's going to be a lot tougher for you to become super successful. It's not impossible, but the fact that you're highly intelligent and your prior or past career deals with a high degree of logic, that's going to be kind of tough to function in the markets.
So one way to wrap your head around the psychology of the overall market and how markets are irrational is I want you to think right now exactly what are you going to have for lunch today? And let's say you do know what you're going to have for lunch today. Because here's the thing. Do you really know what you're going to have? Will you change your mind? Or could someone else change your mind? So a lot of the things that we do are affected by our emotions. And sometimes other people can influence us. So, and if you do know, is there a chance that you might change your mind or your spouse might change theirs? All you married guys in here, you know that your wives will occasionally change your mind. So, if you're not even sure exactly what you're going to have for lunch, how could you be, how could you think that an overall market can deal with exacts? If a market did deal in exacts, then the logic chip designers out there and the statisticians and the computer people and the perfectionists and the control freaks would own the markets. Unfortunately, again, you're dealing with a lot of emotions. Michael says, tell me about it. <laughs> now, before we go much further, one thing I thought about this morning is I do have some copy out there where I use the word exact. If you go to my website slash trading service, davelander.com slash trading service, you'll see that in that copy I wrote, uh, I will show you exactly where to get in, exactly where to place your protective stop. So am I talking out of both sides of my mouth? Well, yes and no. <laughs> Notice that the thing underneath it, it's kind of my saving grace, suggests some discretion such as taking profits a little early some damage control and staying with positions on stop next okay so not exactly but you have to have a framework that you will work with okay um some of my friends who are a little bit more mechanical in nature as i've said quite a bit they kind of see me as as being a little bit more mechanical than I than I let on to be, and and, and it is true because certainly you know I also a lot of times my friends who are more mechanical so I tell them they're a lot more discretionary than they than they let on to be, and that's a conversation for another another time. But you'll need some sort of framework to work with. So like sometimes I'll see. A setup and it just looks perfect and I, I'm sure there's a certain way that I could I could probably quantify that setup so it could be more of an exact type of thing maybe it's a it's a TKO that's a wide range bar let's say it's a wide range bar uh, uh, eight on eight periods um, or something like that and the trend is is you could you could actually maybe quantify that trend a certain way although I'm a discretionary trader Maybe there are some times where things can kind of work a little bit more mechanically. Like if I'm seeing a market that's bottomed out for years and then all of a sudden has a nice bow tie higher, then maybe I'll just, I hate to use the word, close my eyes, but it's almost like close my eyes and automatically take it. But the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes you can do things very mechanically. And then other times, not so much. And it seems like in this more recent environment, it's been a little bit of a not so much type of thing. And I've been applying a little bit more discretion, like uh, Phil was emailing me right before the show, Phil from the UK. Uh, hey, Mark, Mark from the UK is here too, checking in. Uh, see, Good to see you, Mark. And he was asking me, he's like, I've never seen you move the stop on day one. It's like, well, yeah, I actually do move the stop on day one, depending on, on what happens. But in more recent times, I've been a little bit more lenient with my stop. So he might have saw that as, as me being a little bit more mechanical, but in reality, I was actually being more lenient. So hopefully that makes some sense, and we could get to that in one second. But there'll be other times when you're not going to really act in this mechanical way. There's going to be times when you really have to use a lot of discretion. That's discretion going in. Maybe if the market's choppy like it is now, you use a little liberal 
easy for me to say, a somewhat more liberal entry. And if you look, I can't say that word today. And if you if you stick with me for a little while, we're going to get to an example where I had a liberal entry in for a setup, and that helped us to avoid a massively, not a massive, but a pretty big losing trade. So common sense is your best ally when it comes to markets. Now, when it comes to setting the stops, and again, we're not going to get into a whole lot of details this week, but there's just simple little questions you could ask yourself. Where would I be wrong as a trend follower? And a good example of that would be, and I'm, I'm actually watching a Forex pair right now. If you get in on a bow tie coming off of lows, it looks like this, and let's say your low is back here, and, you know, pulls back a little bit, and begins to take off and rally out. So far, so good. But if it comes back in, it goes all the way past that prior low, then this new trend is no longer a new trend. Maybe this old, longer-term trend is resuming. So you need to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? And, again, I don't want to get into a long diatribe on setting stops, but let's say you're in a pullback. It triggers and then it begins to start pulling back. At some point, it's no longer going to be a resumption of the trend. Maybe it is a bona fide reversal back down. So you certainly need to ask yourself, at what point would you be wrong? The good news is common sense, again, is your best ally. Now, one thing you need to ask yourself and your trading in general is, and it's an old commodity adage, pardon my French ladies, um, are you eating like a bird, shitting like an elephant? In other words, are you taking little bitty small profits and then very large losses? Now, I often talk about applying a little discretion when it comes to that initial profit target. Yes, I put an exact initial profit target in whenever I recommend a new setup. It's down here. And you actually see the setup in a second because it didn't trigger. So there is an exact initial profit target, and it's based on the entry plus the initial risk, and you add those together, and that gives you the initial profit target of 28, which I have right here, like on this particular position, okay? So yes, there is an exact place, but let's say that it gets to 27 and I don't know. 85, 27.95, 27.90, and it just keeps bouncing around or getting very close to that initial profit target. Let's say the profit target's here, and the stock comes up, and it gets really, really close, but doesn't quite get there. Well, so what if you take profits a little early and only make about $900 on this first loaf? That's okay. That's 0.9%. Okay, we're going for 1%. But 0.9% is okay, but don't let this stock or, or don't take profits if the stock goes up a half a point. So you're making, let's say, uh, what would that be, like $150. Well, we're going for at least $1,000 per 100K. So, no, you don't want to take a $150 profit on the position, but it's okay to take maybe a $900 profit if it's getting close to that initial profit target but doesn't quite get there okay so just use some common sense when it comes to a lot of these things now the other thing is are you taking mediocre setups and you need to ask yourself is it truly intuition like me seeing that that bow tie off of all time lows it's almost so perfect i just have to just execute bam go in and do it, or is it intuition, which they talked about, I think they came from the first market wizards. So you've got to be careful. And then you've got to ask yourself, is the market itself mediocre? And one thing I want to talk a lot about today, and it never ceases to amaze me how important this concept is, but the net-net change. And ask yourself, is the big, is the big blue arrow pointing sideways? So again, common sense is your best ally, and it doesn't have to be that complicated. If you're a chip designer, you probably don't believe me, but it doesn't. 
So one thing you need to ask yourself when it comes to net net is, is the market higher than it was? But date exactly how long ago? I don't know. Uh, yesterday, some days ago, some weeks ago, some months ago, some years ago. We'll take a look at a real chart or two in just a minute. And in fact, usually in these presentations, somebody asks about a stock. In fact, I do have an example. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But somebody will ask about a stock, and I'll say, yeah, it looks good. Except notice that the net net change over the last three weeks was pretty much nil. In fact, it's actually lower than it was. So is it higher? Is it lower? And of course, people always forget, or many people always forget, sometimes it could just be the same. So is it higher, the same, or lower than it was? And that in and of itself could be quite telling. So remember never to forget about the net net. Now I see this all the time, and I have a live example here in one second. But when people see a market like this, and I've got it drawn in for you. I've got that nice little deceleration of trend drawn in, which is a bad thing. But people will see, they'll look at the low, and then they'll look at the current day's trading, and they'll say, oh, okay, well, that's net-net. That looks pretty good. Dave says i got to check net-net, and it is much higher than it was quite a long time ago. But what they'll also, they also forget is that, Maybe it just hasn't made much forward progress in a while. So, yeah, the big blue arrow might be pointing higher, and maybe the market is headed higher longer term. And if you're long and you're not stopped out, then you could take some solace in the fact that maybe that longer term trend is there. But you have to look at the shorter term net net and ask yourself, is this market losing steam? Now, let's take a look at a live example of this. Somebody recently asked me about BHP a couple days ago, in fact. And I said, well, looks like it's lost some steam. Uh, what are you looking at? And he says, well, I was looking at the run from here to here. And yeah, that's a pretty good run for this particular stock, especially given its volatility and its volume. But what he wasn't seeing was the fact that, and this, this is actually down here a couple days ago when he asked, but I just put today's prices in to keep the math simple. But he wasn't seeing that if you go back in time for a long, long time, all the way back to March, into February, beginning of March, this stock hasn't made much progress. Now, it doesn't mean that it can't trade higher or has not bottomed out longer term. It's just not currently set up. Now, earlier I said perfectionists need not, not apply, but you do want to look for perfection going into a setup. Before you put any capital into harm's way, you want to look for, and I guess I should say, as much perfection as possible. So this is not a perfect setup in that it closed at 28 yesterday, and it closed at... 29 way back in March. So for a couple of months here, at least on a net net basis, it hasn't made any forward progress. So realize you're dealing with an imperfect world, but make sure that setup looks as good as possible going in. Now let's let's take this concept of net net. Oh, we got a question from Bars Bars. So nice, he named himself twice. Could that be just sideways consolidation before resuming higher? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, my favorite pattern, I mean, obviously, I love getting into setup, and I love having to do this, right? Okay, because that makes you feel real good, and that's exciting. But what I would much rather have, instead of have that happen, I would much rather have a stock, or any other market for that matter, kind of creep along, go up a little bit, base, go up a little bit, base, and go up a little bit, and base again, a la Darvis style. If I could ever figure out a way to identify Darvis stocks ahead of time, you'd never see my fat ass again, because 
those type of moves are sustainable. So Bars is asking, could this just be a consolidation before it makes another leg higher? Absolutely. Okay. But this isn't how we trade. We trade, we're swing traders looking for that little pullback or a little transition and hoping to get that swing trade out. And then we're looking to capture that longer term gain. So we're not going to see something in a base like this and say, okay, we're going to buy it because it's in a longer term trend. No, we're going to wait to see if it could break out of that base and look to play the first pullback. Then, and I hate to use the word hopefully, but hopefully what will happen is it will turn into that Darvis stock where it goes up, consolidates, goes up, consolidates, goes up, consolidate, rinse and repeat. So why might you ask I would prefer my stocks that I'm long to do this as opposed to this? And the reason is because this is not sustainable. When a market begins to go parabolic, what happens? It, it often crashes. And even if the trend does resume after the crash, you've been knocked out of that market. And then you watch it take off without you. But a move that does this is much more sustainable because it gives people a chance to jockey for position, to get in, to get out, do what they have to do. And it's not this big, huge euphoria. It kind of just creeps along. Okay. There's probably a system somewhere in there where you could figure out a way to do something similar to Darvis. Maybe Darvis is system in and of itself. Okay. To those of you who aren't familiar with Darvis, he wrote a book, How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market. It's been a few years since I read it. But it's a good book, especially if you're a little bit newer to technical analysis, because he just kind of had a simple little system and he didn't know anything about stocks. He was a professional dancer and, and he got paid in some little stock and didn't really pay much attention to it. And then one day he happened to check it out and he realized that it was moving higher. And the people who couldn't afford him pay, to pay him and paid him with some little crappy stock, he actually got paid much more. And then he became addicted to uh, stock trading. And what he would do, he was using, um, I guess back then it was telegraphs to telegraph his uh, trades and get his information. And he would wait for a stock to move from one, he calls it a box, to another. So in order for him to make a buy, and I don't know the exact system, but in a nutshell, it's pretty much like, okay, well, it's trading in this box here between, I don't know, 20 and 30. Uh, when, it, when it gets out of the box and trades it to the 30, 40 box, maybe I'll make my buy then. Okay, but it's something along those lines. And then he would, if it moved out of a box, I guess he would get out. And the idea was to keep trend following as it made boxes on top of boxes. But I call it a box stock. And those those can work those really well longer term. Once you get into a nice little swing trade, it turns into this intermediate term trade. And you've got a fairly wide stop underneath then you're able to ride out those longer term trends. By the way, for those of you who aren't completely familiar with the methodology, and again, today's not going to be a lesson on everything, but now might lend itself well to that. The idea is to have that tight or fairly tight swing trade stop to get that first little swing trade out and then let this stop kind of gradually begin to open up. Now, as I was telling Phil this morning, Let's say you do have a stock that moves up like this much. On the first low, for the first half of your trade, you will stair step that stop up almost on a one from one basis. Now, the reason Phil didn't realize I did that was because I've been a little bit more liberal in recent times and letting things open up on the first low. But in general, in general, I'm bumping it up on a one from one basis. Now, by the first low, let's say you buy a thousand shares. 500 is going to be treated as what? A swing trade. And then 500 is going to be treated as a longer term trade. Maybe a Darvis stock, okay? Hopefully a Darvis. D A R V. Is there a U in there somewhere? I forget. Darvis. D A R V U S. I have to find the book. I never know which books are going to come up in my uh, presentations. And my books are all mixed up now. Anyway, the book is How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market. I should have it. I think I used to have a list of books on my website. I need to fix that page. 
But anyway, the first loaf, the first half, I call it a loaf. I worked uh, with a hedge fund for about 14 years, and he called everything a loaf. And, and that's where that came from because people ask me, why do you call it a loaf? Well, that's why. The first loaf, or the first half is a swing trade. second half is a longer-term trade. So again, you stair step higher initially, and then the stair step starts looking like this. Now, on the charts, it'll look like a very long-term moving average. That's kind of one way. That's kind of one way to wrap your heads around uh, your head around what a stop might look like. And by slowly letting that open up, it's not actually a longer-term moving average. But people often ask me that. And what I used to do when I do a presentation was I used to go in each day, and I used to like put a little tick each day. And this was just real painstaking to do this when setting up my chart. So now what I do is I just kind of eyeball where the stop was here and then where it is here and where it is here and where it is here. And I just kind of connect the dots. But in reality, it would kind of look like this. You know, it, well, it's it's only to go higher. So, yeah, the stop does start looking like a longer term moving average. Okay, now. Darvis, D-A-R-V, well, we spelled three ways. <laughs> Darvis, Cajun food, D-A-R-V-A-S, okay? According to Wikipedia, Darvis, D-A-R-V-A-S, okay, Darvis, Darvis, Darvis. We have three votes for Darvis with an A and one vote for Darvis with an I. So we're going to go with the A. Okay, thank you guys, appreciate that. I never claim to be a genius. In fact, they call me the trend following moron. All right, now, before we forget about the net debt, let's talk about the S&P 500. Uh, yesterday, or whenever that was, day before, this big day here, I got an email. Hey, Dave, is this the start of something new or a, or a bear rally? Or uh, what, do we, what do you call those things? A bear trap. And I'm like, well, you know me. This market is going to have to do more than just have one big up day for me to get excited. And I'm sure I went on to say, is, let's not forget about the net net. Now, we had a little follow through yesterday in the S&P 500. And we closed right here. 20, I don't know, was that 2080, 2085, 20 something, somewhere in there. But go back in time. And where was the market? Way back in April. Okay. Right about where it is. Or was yesterday. Okay. So it's very important not to get too caught up in one or two days action and always focus on what's happening on a net net basis. Now, yes, net net yesterday it was it's up a little net net week over week it's up a little, but then net net week over weeks or a few weeks back it's hasn't changed much. And then draw that line going all the way back as far back as you can go and still intersect prices. And this is 2014. Now, I haven't done a lot of studies on it other than just empirical evidence. But for a market to be trending, it's it, it's like it needs to keep keep on trending. And I noticed in uh, Tom McClellan's group the other day, I just kind of skim these groups. I don't really have the, the time to uh, to get in and do a lot of um reading into these groups. I have my own research that I'm working on and own projects and things that just keep me much, keep me so busy. I don't have time to look at anyone else's. And that sounds kind of selfish, but it's just what it is. I need to clone myself, I guess. Anyway, they were doing something about uh, when the markets, when the high, when the markets have a high number of unchanged stocks, it means that the trend could be coming to an end. And I like what somebody in the group said, and I wish I would remember who said it, but he said, it's like a tennis ball. You throw a bunch of tennis balls in the air at some point, I think they call it the apogee, at some point at the apogee, it's going to stop going higher before it starts coming back down. So if you're looking at markets, so we'll take a look at like a, uh, a monthly chart in a few minutes. And then if you go back at a couple of presentations that I've done a while back, I show the market looks like this. And then you, if you really pay attention, it's really kind of lost a lot of steam in here. So that debt you need to speed sleep how, how how do you speed sleep you know i tried years ago it's, it's gonna sound kind of crazy 
but I try to replace sleep with meditation so I'd have more time to do things. That's kind of, that's, 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 I'm kind of sick like that. <laughs> very, very type A type of person. Very rarely do I sit around and, and not do anything. Uh, yeah, shoot me an email. Teach me how to speed sleep. Uh, Oral Schwarzenegger once was, was talking about motivation and, uh, how do you do all these things? How do you do work harder than everyone else? How do, would, would, don't you need sleep? And he's like, sleep faster. That was his answer. So, <laughs> yes, shoot me an email on that if that's a real thing, because I, I might want to do that. Okay, so that, that changed. Not a whole lot of forward progress in a long time. Then when we get to the monthly chart in a little while, you'll see we've lost some momentum. So the point that I was making earlier is that sometimes you're going to have an apogee in stocks, and then they're going to roll over from there. Is this the end? I don't know. This market is, has uh, kind of faked out quite a bit for a long time. But at the least, and one thing I've been looking at a lot lately and thinking about this morning is you start connecting the highs and lows, and what do you have? You have an electrocardiogram type of market, a market that lacks direction, okay? And usually when it starts this electrocardiogram action at high levels, usually it ends badly, okay, because everybody's just getting caught up in the swings, caught up in the swings, caught up in the swings, and eventually everyone throws in a towel. And we'll take a look at a few more things when we get to the, the actual charts. But the point I want to make here is that net-net could be your best ally. Now, any questions on... Anything we've covered so far before we get into um, a live lesson here? Okay. Uh, we got a good good example this morning on waiting for entries. I'm dieting, so every time I see entries, it looks like entrees. I'm like, entrees? Mmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we got DLTR was a short. And we had an entry of 74, 75, and it was a bow tie pattern. So let's take a look at that chart. Now, a second ago, I said discretion and, and doing things. So instead of putting that entry right here in a textbook fashion, right below this low here, hopefully you can see that. So if you have a low and you're going to short in a textbook fashion, you would short right below that low. OK, so right below this low, instead of putting the entry here, I put it somewhere in here to give it a little wiggle room. OK. And as you can see, it would have triggered using that quote unquote textbook entry, that mechanical entry, if you will. But by giving it a little bit of room. And following the plan, there's a few lessons in here, right? I'm sneaking in that following the plan thing to plan the trade, follow the plan thing. Obviously, you avoid a really ugly trade because look what happened. It took off. Now, it wouldn't be the end of the world if this happened to you. You would only lose maybe 3%. I'm just kind of eyeballing it. So you would still live to fight another day. And trust me, it happens. And it's one thing I was thinking about a lot yesterday. I'm working on this beginner's course, and it just keeps more. You see a lot of the slides find their way into these weekly charts such as the net net talk, but it's, it's kind of um, morphing into this thing where I keep wanting to throw more and more into it and, and, and tell people things. And one thing I was really thinking about yesterday that I've got to figure out a way to work into the course. And maybe when it comes to psychology, I'll, I'll explain it to them uh, or right after the money management is that something bad will happen to you in your career and something bad will happen more than once okay um and that's why you have to have this money management plan i start i was going to tell some war stories but that's a two drink minimum on some of these um and some of them i could tell you but then i'd have to kill you obviously but something bad will happen sooner or later so let me interview myself am i saying that using a liberal entry will keep you out of trade that does this no okay Something bad will eventually happen to you. And it will happen more than one time. 
But sometimes, and I hate to use the word lucky because we were following a plan, but sometimes you get lucky and you miss the entry because, or it misses the entry and then does something disastrous like this, but no capital was put into harm's way. I talked to someone yesterday and they said, it, I, they're, they're telling me at least based yesterday that they are not taking trades unless they actually trigger. Now, based on things in my service. Before, it was, they would ask me about a stock. I'm like, what stock is that? I know I tell a story all the time. It's, it's, it's not just one person. I'm not just picking this one person. I'm picking on, or I'm talking about a plethora of people. I'm like, I didn't recommend that stock. Yes, you did. And then they show me when I did. It's like, well, it's one like, looks like this one. And they got into it six months ago, but it never triggered. But what did they do? Well, I'm, they front ran the setup. They got in right here, thinking that they would get in before the rest of the world sees it or the rest of the people in the service. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't talk out of both sides of my mouth. But if, if you're in the mother of all trending markets, then by all means, you might you might want to step on the gas a little bit, push the system to the edge uh, and do things like front run a setup here and there. But based on the electrocardiogram nature of this market that we have now, now is not one of those times, okay, to do those things. So waiting for an entry can often keep you out of a lot of trouble. All right, any questions on anything, comments, criticisms, complaints? I'm using antidotes. Okay. Let me get my chart set up. Uh, while I'm doing that, if there's uh, any individual, you could always ask questions too. Um, if there's any individual stocks you want to talk about, feel free to ask about them now. My only my only requirement or my only suggested is just put a stock on a line and hit return. And that way I can tell whether or not I talked about it. And you'll get all of your stocks answered. All right, we should have plenty of time today. I didn't pontificate too long. Okay. Uh, we just said the P's are kind of sideways at best. And so far today, we obviously are not seeing any follow through here. Okay. It's kind of Flatsville. Um, I kind of expected yesterday to be like today. Kind of reminds me like the uh, an economist will tell you tomorrow why what they predicted yesterday didn't come true today. <laughs> Anyway, uh, but the, the point being, I kind of expected yesterday to be like today because a lot of times you just have this everybody and their brother has to buy stocks, and then the next day you have a shoulder shrug. So, well, everybody and their brother had to buy stocks over the last two days. Got a lot of people all excited. And then so far today, it's like, eh, not so much, okay? So the point I was making earlier is if we go to maybe a weekly chart, let's see if that helps. Yeah, weekly chart. You could see that obviously we've headed higher for a long, long time, but we've begun to roll over in here or at least lose momentum. Okay, so uh, people get mad at you when you say a market might be going down. You know, you say markets go up, markets go down, and look at you like you pooed your pants, you know. But then you say market might be going down. Well, no, no, no. They get all excited. Not, not you trader types that are in here, the average person who deals with markets they just think markets always go up but they don't unfortunately so we have lost quite a bit of steam in a while that's a weekly s p chart uh by the way the weekly bow ties are still in effect from last summer so we got a sell stick this is the slowest rollover I've ever seen in my life if you go back to last summer i got all excited about this bow tie and this bow tie remains in place. Now, exactly when will I become bullish is the question that I've been asked ever since last summer. And the answer to that question is, well, within my framework, as a trend follower, the market would at least have to make it to new highs. And so far, it hadn't died. I mean, it sold off a little bit. It had a big retrace. Had it sold off a little bit again, or a lot of bit, I should say. And then now it's going right back up. So... It would actually have to make it to new highs and stay there before I would start getting, and I hate to use the word bullish. I'm not necessarily bearish right now. I'm just cautious, okay? You 
you look at a lot of charts and I figured and I don't want to fudge the numbers anyway but I think it was 10 million if I do the math you know several thousand a day 20 something years I think that comes to 10 million so if you look at a lot of charts you begin to see patterns that reoccur and things happen and one discovery was the simple little bow tie pattern. And I'm not the first guy to to discover a moving average crossover, but I just kind of use them in a certain way within a certain, there's that word, framework again. And I discovered, especially on a weekly basis when it comes to indices, that when you have a weekly bow tie, you better pay attention because last couple times this happened, the market lost uh, almost half and then over half of its value, respectively. And then last time, a couple of times we had buy signals, the market have has gone up well over 100%, I think 200% in the S&Ps. So it pays to pay attention. And as my buddy Greg Moore says, I'll quote him every week, probably just enough. Did I just say probably? Um, P-R-O-L-L-Y. But as Greg says, um, we treat all signals as if it will become the big one. And Greg just retired from running about $6 billion dollars five billion six billion billion here billion there who cares right but um five or six billion might have even been um closer to eight at the peak of the fund but he's ran a lot of money and he's been he's got a lot of uh experience and he's been through he's a few scars i'm sure to show for it and that's why he believes in treating all signals seriously so i know that do this every week but that was a sell back here this is a buy this was a sell this was a buy and now we have a sell, and there's a big question mark right here, okay? Will it work? I don't know. But I'm going to stay prudent, and where exactly will it become bullish? Well, if it makes new highs and stays there. Now, NASDAQ, you could argue that the S&P isn't far from new highs, and eh, it'll probably get there, or maybe it'll get there. It wouldn't take that much to get this market to new highs. And who knows? Maybe the Fed would step on the gas or whatever. And, and push it up there and try to get the market moving. Anybody here remember when the Fed could care less about the markets and you would like, please give us give us a quarter of percent interest rate uh, deduction cut, please. No, and it's like, damn, that Fed. And now it's like, let's just step on the gas and see what we can do. NASDAQ, net net problem there. And also tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of overhead supply to deal with nothing magical about that overhead supply it's just that people who bought the market during this range might be looking to get out at break even now here's the thing getting back to that apogee of a tennis ball let's say you bought a bunch of technology stocks some kind of little growth fund or something way back in 2014 and as i've told the story recently as, as one of my wife's friends did and then here you are a year and a half later and you add on some management fees and now you're hurt and pop and you begin to wonder, is this investment thing really working? And again, go back to 2009 when we just pretty much going straight up except for the last year and a half. There's people behind those bars and those people buy and sell for a variety of reasons. So maybe the people who were thinking about their their retirement or their kids college education they're seeing that that capital begin to deteriorate or certainly not grow anymore and then they're beginning to think about return of capital versus return on capital so never forget there's people behind the bars so that that apogee of this market by going sideways could be could be wearing down these people, especially the Johnny Come Latelys. Johnny Come Latelys are the last in and the first out, the fast money. They finally throw in a towel and they just jump on a market, and then as soon as they start losing money, they jump out. And those people could really fudge up a market. So that's part of the problem we have now is. There's potentially a, quite a few Johnny Come Latelys in this market. Now, the worst thing could happen, let me just go to P's real quick. I, I promise I'll, I'll finish up in just one second so we get to your stocks. 
I think the worst thing can happen, and in markets, one thing I like to do, instead of being like, oh, we got a bow tie, the market's going down, the market's going down. Well, I have been a little bit like that since last summer. But I'm also thinking, well, what if that doesn't work? What's another plausible scenario? And the bear case, the bull case would take care of itself because the market just goes up and up and up and up and we just follow along. But the bear case would be if this market went up and made new highs, that would excite a lot of people. The Johnny Come Latelys would be buying, okay? The people who were getting ready to sell because they had the year and a half or two years or whatever where they're losing juniors education fund or they're wondering if they're going to be able to retire in, um, I don't know, I'll just pull the city out the air, Detroit versus Antigua. I don't know. <laughs> but you get the idea, the, the, a lifestyle. Is there going to be a lifestyle change if, this, if they keep losing money in the markets or if, they, if it doesn't grow anymore? So they're faced with some hard choices. But if the market goes on to new highs, then everyone, the buy and hope crowd, I mean buy and hold, I'm sorry, breathes a collective sigh of relief. And then if the market does begin to implode after that, that's when it gets really, really ugly. Now, I'm not predicting that. I'm not saying that. I'm not like these guys that come out every five years and make a big prediction. And they're wrong, by the way. They're wrong. They haven't been right yet, but they, they're still – putting books out there. The reason I say that is I logged in this morning and I got a pop-up ad uh, from from somebody who's who writes a book every few years. I think in 2000, he wrote about the great, the great coming, the great coming 80,000 points uh, in, the, in the Dow and, and 10 million points in the NASDAQ bull market. And what happened? Well, the market crashed. <laughs> so anyway, a lot harder to uh, to actually trade than to uh, than to talk about crashes. Those books make a lot of money, though. You just say, oh, there's going to be a crash. So I don't know that this is going to be a crash. I just think that the market's in a lot of trouble, so far at least, or it certainly isn't doing great. But, you know, the routine one day at a time. And, and Dave, you bearish? What's in the portfolio? I think we're mostly long. I think we're 100% long. Okay, so that's because we've been having long side setups. And we're just listening to the database. By the way, now's I said I would would only talk for a minute, and there we go. <laughs> now's not the time to be buying the overall stock market. It's it's a market of stocks versus a stock market. It's okay to go in and take some setups as you see them. We got a little IPO that's worked out okay so far in the portfolio. We've got a metals and mining stock. We've got a, a oil stock um, because we saw the setups, and they were worth taking. And I like the fact that the IPO was speculative and wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit it in the ass. So I could trade contra to the overall market or in lieu of the overall market if the market begins to sell off. And then these commodity stocks could trade contra to the overall market. I didn't buy them just because they could. I bought them because they were set up. So I'm not going to label myself a bear and, and not see a setup when it occurs, but it's going to have to be a darn good looking setup as long as the market doesn't make it to new highs. And again, I know I've beaten the dead horse on the rusty, but the rusty has a tremendous amount of overhead supply to overcome. So it's got its work cut out for it. And that's a broader based market. And that's what's going on internally in the stock market. Um, some areas have improved tremendously as of late insurance, not so much insurance overall, but like an individual uh, subsector issue. Insurance has done pretty good. You can see overall it still looks like it's in trouble or certainly not making new highs. But at a subsector level, a lot of the subsectors here are banging on new highs. I'm having a hard time getting excited about insurance, but it could happen. Take a look at real estate. Real estate looks like it's in trouble too. Bit of a first thrust, could bow tie soon. Problem with the real estate stocks is they're kind of low in volatility. Uh, retail, I've been bearish on retail, but uh, obviously uh, some good news in today on some of these retail stocks, and I might have to change my tune on that. But until and unless they get the brand new highs and stay there, like everything else, again, you have to have a framework to work around. I'm not going to get too excited. 
about that. Now, metals and mining and the energies, these commodity-related stocks, they have been pulling back as of late. And yes, they have lost some steam. That's why I'm getting more and more selective. And guess what? The database is producing fewer and fewer setups. The gold stocks might still have a chance in here. And we'll get to those in one second. But I would like to see this market move away from this pullback and make some new highs and then consolidate again. But it is losing a little steam in here right now. And by the way, how many days since the pullback? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirty. So it's about a about a month worth of pullback in here. So yeah, it's lost a little bit of steam. Moving averages still look okay, but the energies have lost some steam. Ditto for metals and mining. Metals and mining have had a little bit more correction in here, as you can see. But so far, they still look like they have potential. But again, I'm more excited on an individual issue basis here than I am about the overall sector. Let's take a look at the gold stocks. Gold stocks look a little bit better than the rest. They're a little choppy, both somewhat shorter term and somewhat longer term. But if you kind of squint your eyes, you can see they just, they pull back in here after a pretty massive run. Now, if you go back and look last few weeks in charts, go back a few weeks, I should say, in the week in charts, you'll see that back here, I didn't like the fact that they were losing steam but the market took off anyway. The market could do whatever it wants. The market hands me my ass quite often. The market humbles me quite often, okay? It humbles everyone quite often. We all read about these famous traders and they, how much money they made, and but later on, you find out they've subsequently blown up. So you have to constantly take small bets, constantly have a money management plan in, in place, and then allow yourself for the occasional home run. Longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Sometimes, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about the fact that we didn't really get on these gold stocks, is that sometimes, and I get asked a lot of questions, and, and sometimes I don't think I make a good case to explain this. Sometimes my methodology doesn't catch every move. Okay, no methodology does. And sometimes you have to be willing to pass on something if it doesn't fit your methodology. You have to find, in general, one methodology and follow it. And number two, realize that you can't kiss all the women. Sometimes you might have to let some setups go that do not fit the methodology. And that was part of the problem is those gold stocks lost momentum and then they decided to take off again. But gold looking okay again. I got a few on my radar right now. I'm sure you guys will probably ask, ask about them if you haven't already done so. Um, Okay, speaking of which, all right, just want to go through one or two more. Uh, utilities still look like they're in trouble. In general, these interest rate sensitive areas still look like they're in trouble in here. The overall market, eh, I don't know. I think I'd remain skeptical for now. It's kind of a show me type of market. Uh, in spite of bonds kind of hanging in there and going sideways, these interest rate sensitive areas, such as real estate and utilities, look like they could be in trouble. All right, Art wants to know about EDU. I have found that educational stocks can be kind of choppy and, and crazy. Um, this one, it sort of took off, and then now it kind of went sideways. It's Maybe it's kind of box-ish looking. But it just doesn't jump out at me as something that would be worthwhile. Maybe on a pullback, if it were able to make new highs, because look at where it is now and look at where it was. So let's measure that. So it's up a couple percent over what? A little bit over a month, which isn't that much, especially when you consider the volatility of this stock is, is fairly high at 42 HV on a 50-day basis. So this stock would have to break out to new highs and then pull back before I would consider it. Now let's see what's going on longer term. So you're up, you are up towards new highs here longer term. So if it did break out to new highs, maybe it would be okay. But for now, I don't think it's uh, I think I would pass on that one. And then I'm a little bit biased against educational stocks. I'm a little bit biased against shipping stocks. Um, 
I did a lot of research on a lot of trend following systems on a lot of different areas. And as a general statement, they don't really work really well in shipping and they don't really work well in educational stocks. Now that might just be an aberration, but I've never forgotten that. And every time I look at shipping or educational stocks, I see, wow, they do chop around a lot. So I'm not a huge fan of these educational stocks. Not that I would never buy them. It's like never say never. But that's one thing that's always in the back of my mind. AJ wants to know about IAG. That's going to be a gold stock. I am gold. Uh, that looks pretty good. I'd actually like a little bit more pullback. That is in my Landry list for today, which is my list of stocks that I publish in the service that I'm watching. Uh, but I'd like a little bit more pullback. Maybe I'm looking for too much perfection. So, you know, the question earlier, exactly how much should a market pull back? I don't know. It depends, but this market's going up like 300%. So I'd like to see the mother of all knockout moves here. Okay. But it does look pretty good. It does look pretty good. So I'll give you an okay on that one. Rick wants to know about AG. That's going to be a silver stock, I think. Yeah, first Majestic. Again, we've got a nice trend here. Uh, IAG looks a little better because it's pulled back a little further. But you've got a nice trending stock, a little bow tie back here in February. That was kind of a nice little uh, deal. That's pretty cool. But it's also had a pretty good run. It's up several hundred percent. So I'd like to see a little bit more knockout. The problem is once you get the knockout, you do have some sideways action here. So I'm not sure what the chart would look like after that. So we'd have to wait and see. But uh, for now, it needs more knockout. Or new highs followed by a pullback, obviously. GCP for Mr. Donald. GCP, GCP. Um, well, this stock, it took it a long time, and, and it didn't make a whole lot of progress. Okay. So let me interview myself. Is it trending? Yes, but not with a tremendous amount of vigor. The HV is 25. That's fairly low. As I often say, people fool themselves by thinking that, oh, I'm going to trade a less volatile stock, so I'll have less risk. Well, in order to make the, make the position management work, you have to put on more shares because otherwise your position won't, won't even be worthwhile. And when you put on more shares, something bad could, could still happen. So this stock would have to accelerate higher for me to get excited about it and then pull back. So I would leave that alone. Per, what do you think, Mr. Chuck? P-E-R, you ladies are quiet today. Uh, well, what did we talk about? Net, net, okay. Where is it? Where was it? Okay. Connect the lines, draw your arrow. So it's sideways. Now. It does look like it's bottoming out, but I would never buy a market because it's bottoming out. Okay. The S&P has been topping out for almost a year. So I'm not going to sell short the S&P just because it's topping out. What's the, uh, what did I write about recently? The big short. I'm not wrong. I'm just early. That's the same thing, Michael. So I think you could be, early on this trade so let it bottom out wait for that next bow tie and then look to get long by the way you did have a bow tie in here it looked okay not too long ago uh, by the way it is on a little bit on the thin side too but the bow tie really didn't get past these prior highs so also when you watch these bow ties make sure that it's clearing some prior highs in here so wait for the next bow tie you do have some bad memories in here but maybe by the time it got all the way up there you wouldn't have to, if you were long from somewhere after a bow tie down here, that'd be far enough away. I don't know. I'll know it when I see it. Fur short. No. Okay. I preach trend, 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 trend. Draw your arrows, draw your arrows, draw your arrows. Well, this is at a downtrend. But if you're going to short a market, as I often preach, I would much rather short a market at higher levels than, than way down here. Now, if the overall market is at a longer term downtrend, then all you might be left with is stocks that are beaten up in, in longer term downtrends. Towards the end of 2000, 
and eight, you'll probably notice if you go back and look at the archives and service, or if you were in a service and you remember it, you'll notice that I was recommending shorts that were in longer term downtrends. Why? Well, because my favorite charts, those are just rolling over from high levels, and the bigger they are, the harder they fall. They just weren't existing. It weren't existing anymore because the market has been in such a serious downtrend for so long. The other thing too is when you see big gaps like this, I tend to avoid markets because they can trade a little erratic after them. I mean, this gap back here wasn't necessarily that huge, and you were at higher levels. But the other thing that's that's jumping out at me is that this stock is kind of thin for shorting at only uh, 200,000, 250,000 on average volume, a little bit on the thin side for shorting. So I would avoid that. If you do want to short something, find something that's at higher levels in the early phases of rolling over. Okay, Andre? Uh, GPL is going to be a silver stock for Mr. John. GPL. I think I have uh, a testimonial from John on my homepage. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Uh, this, is kind of a, this is kind of a dilemma with this stock because it's had such a run. It needs a lot of correction, but then it's too many days of the pullback, okay? So, again, sometimes you can't always get on the next leg or you can't catch every stock. And also, net-net, it's going kind of sideways here, as you can see. So I would pass on that one. It's still in an uptrend. If you're long, stay long and just trail your stop higher, okay? Starbucks, I'm probably not going to be a fan, but as a short, ah, ah, interesting. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, these high, um, I'm not a big fan of these super thick stocks like Starbucks and all, but because they're very efficient. And by efficient, I mean there's a lot of players, there's a lot of analysts that are following these stocks. But when they begin to crack, they can crack in a serious way. They can become very inefficient on the downside. And that's the basis of my go-go, no-mo strategy is you look for these longer-term darlings, longer-term momentum stocks that have lost momentum and are beginning to crack. And then you use a bow tie or a first thrust or something to, um, to enter. Now, with that said, I'm really not seeing anything to get excited about with Starbucks, but I hear you, okay? If you were to short a stock, I would much rather short this stock than that aforementioned uh, REIT that was down at low levels. You probably couldn't even borrow that REIT, by the way. So I guess talking about that stock is hypothetical anyway. And eh, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? As I often wonder, when would these hypothetical questions end? Um, somebody just emailed me that recently. I don't, know, I don't know who said that, but it looks okay as far as the shorts. You could, do, you could do much worse. But, yeah, if you're going to short a market, short a market that looks like that, that's still coming off of fairly high levels. Let's take a look at weekly bow tie in this for S&Gs. You know, maybe this could turn into the mother of all weekly bow ties. Yeah, look at that. You could get a weekly bow tie. When that thing weekly bow ties, that's going to be the mother of all shorts. Okay. Has it ever done it before? I wonder. Nope. Right here. Was it clear? Let's see. Yeah, it looked like, looked like you had a pretty serious weekly bow tie way back in. 2007, but the whole world bow tied back then, so you can't really get too excited about that. But yeah, it's a little wide and loose, and, and but is it going up or going down? Looks like it's headed lower. CCI, it's going to be another one of those uh, commodity-related stocks. Oh, never mind. I get that one confused with uh, another one. Uh, good volume. That's got a little bit thicker stock. It's just kind of on the, on the early phases of breaking out. But then look at your HV, 13. What's the overall market? 18, 19, 10. Oh, to my surprise, markets, HV in the market's lower than I thought it was. I'm going to be thinking of the NASDAQ or the Russell. Yeah, Russell's 16. Okay. So it's just not volatile enough to make trading it worthwhile. So it would have to break out decisively to brand new highs and then pull back, but I, I would leave it alone. Uh, I mean, as far as relative strength goes, it's a, it's a good looking relative strength stock, meaning that it's probably outperforming the overall market, but it's not worth going after. CCL for Don. CCL is a good example of a stock that we shorted at high levels. And I forget exactly when we did that. Um, we may have gotten shaken out before this big spill. I don't remember. It's like I forget about a trade as soon as I 
I'm done with it. Uh, yeah, Don. Uh, oh, CCL. That's Colgate. Sorry, brain fart here. This is the trade. Yeah, we, we did okay on this one. I'm sorry, brain fart. I, I was wondering why I couldn't figure out where we did it. Yeah, it's pretty obvious now. There's your bow tie there. It was a little wide and loose, but I thought it was worthwhile. And it had a nice little slide, but then it came back up and stopped us out. Uh, right now, it's too wide and loose, too sideways to go after as a new trade. But yeah, it doesn't look like a stock you'd want to buy. Is that the 50-day HV you use? Yes, and it's right here in the charts. It's just 50-day historical volatility. I have the formula for Telechart. I also have it for Metastock. Uh, but if you need it for Metastock, instead of asking me, you could just Google Google it on the Internet and get it if you want. That's where I got it from, um, at least more recently. I think like in 1999, I wrote it in, um, in Metastock way back then. But... In more recent times, I just Google it. But I do have the HP formula for Telechart, which I think I got out of the forum years ago. Okay, uh, AXTI, AXTI is a long. Uh, we talked about this one last week. Or look, you see right here, we got this X on the charts. So we probably talked about that one. Uh, Andre, Andre, you long the stock? I didn't like this wide range bar up followed by the drift. But Dave, it's going higher. Well, yes, it's going higher, but... Again, it doesn't always work perfectly. And also, it's fairly thin given the price of the stock. And just the way it, I can look at it and see it, it trades very thinly. So I would leave that alone. CDXC for Mr. Donnell. CDXC, CDXC. Um, this one looks okay. This was on my uh, service a while back, but it's kind of thin or super thin now. And that's why I took it off. Uh I would pass just because it's so thin on that. SWN. Uh, well, it looks like it's bottomed out longer term. And I do like what I call these uh, Phoenix stocks. It's not an official strategy, but I'm looking for a stock to go down and bottom out longer term after falling from grace. Uh, super, super high levels. This stock was, what, 40-something, 50 bucks a share back in 2014. And now it's about a fourth of that amount. Uh, I think it's bottomed out. I think it's worth putting on your radar. But for me to get excited, I have to break out to new highs and then the next pullback. Because look, if you're already long, stay long. But look at how many days you have in this pullback here. Okay. And that's just energies overall. A lot of the stocks have lost momentum. Trip, humor me. Ready to break? Which way? All right, Angelo. T R I P. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I tell you what, sell a bunch of calls on it, and then it'll break out to the upside, or sell a bunch of puts, and it'll break out to the downside. I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Um, I wouldn't call that a bottom. I mean, if anything, it, it looks. I think uh, my wife hates when I say this, uh, but uh, put a gun to my head, I would say it's going to break out to the downside. That would be the way to bet, but no. What? Why? Why would you? Why would you torment yourself? Why would you do that to yourself? Okay, my wife often asks me that. Why would you do that to yourself? You know, it's like you're right, especially when it comes to children and them aggravating you. Your friend did. What did your friend do, Angelo? Did he sell a bunch of calls? Well, markets are pretty perverse. He bought calls. Oh, good luck for your friend. At least he could only lose what he put up. I mean, if you're selling calls, you can get into a lot of trouble. That's a three drink minimum story. All right. Uh, looks like uh, we got a quiet bunch today. Uh, any any more stocks? Golds. Too much short term overhead supply. Pull back a deep enough. Okay. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the underlying commodity first, which I meant to do earlier. And then we'll take a look at the stocks real quick. Oh, good. Okay, lots of – all right, keep them coming, keep them coming. Um, gold, the underlying commodity, beating the bow tie down in here. Um, I wouldn't call gold done just yet. Uh, some people are. I think it's too early for that. It could just be consolidating in here. But obviously, if it breaks much lower, then I would lose uh, – any excitement that I might have for gold, okay? So if it takes out the bottom of this range, this is GLD. 
So let's take a look at the gold stocks. This is the commodity. Longer term, it just kind of still kind of looks like a bottom to me. Shorter term, looks like it could be in trouble though, okay? Because it is bow tying of the short term. I don't trade the short term, but I'm more excited about a bow tie like this coming off of multi-year lows. This is a good bow tie right here. Write that down, okay? Coming off of multi-year lows, you want those. Coming off of multi-month highs, eh, I'm not as excited, okay? about that because this is look at this multi-year lows many many years lows that's a good bow tie right here these can work obviously and as i've said before i see a lot of bloggers talking about bow ties mid-range bow ties and that's fine i don't care um they rarely mention my name but that's okay i'm next to you know my wife keeps saying i know i say this <laughs> often why could you be like bollinger and name something after yourself i'm like i, I keep forgetting i'm sorry um all right let's take a look at the gold stocks but yeah the, the mid-level bow ties not as excited about those as i am when when a market makes major major lows and then makes a bow tie and the same thing goes for the high side that's why earlier we we're looking at that short way down at low levels i'd much rather short something at high levels now the gold stocks look a little bit better than the gold itself okay we talked about these a minute ago but you can see so far just kind of pulling back and this is a little an arc. It goes a little bit against everything I just said about net net and and loss of momentum, et cetera. But so far, they still look OK because you did have a pretty serious run from lows. And then so far, you just got to pull back in that and too many days in the pullback. But it hasn't really broken down. But you can see those moving averages are beginning to roll over a little bit. By the way, nothing magical about moving averages, as I often say, or any indicator. But an indicator can help to illustrate what's happening. So looking at these moving averages and seeing them turn down, that makes me think, aha, maybe, maybe this market has lost some steam. And then you whip out your net net change, go back in time, and on a net net basis, it hasn't made any progress since when? Since April. It's actually down since the middle of April. So that's six weeks on a net net basis, at least, where it's traded lower. So I still think the uptrend remains in place here, but it certainly has begun to lose some momentum, and the underlying commodity is not looking so good. So that's why you're seeing a couple of gold stocks on the Landry list today, but they're not – I'm just not ready to go after them for that reason and being part of the reason, and then the other reason being that I'm kind of picking apart the setups. I want to see a little bit more pullback maybe, a little bit more perfection in those setups. So maybe I'm, I'm willing to pass on those. All right, Otis wants to know about INGN, INGN. Um, well, right now, it's just kind of retracing back up. It's, it would be too late to play the pullback there. It's also thin. It's, uh, it's not incredibly thin, but it can trade thinly. Um, for me to get excited, I'd, I'd like to see a stock like this make new highs. I'm not a big fan of stocks when they're making a big picture retrace like this. Now, if they're way down at low levels like that little energy stock and then just beginning to come off those lows like back here, I'm more excited about them than if they just retrace it back to their old high. So I would pass on that one for now. FXY is the yen. Um, I am long the yen or short the yen? I forget. I think it might be sh short a 60-minute chart. Um But, yeah, the yen has headed high, is headed higher or has been heading higher. But shorter term, it looks like it could be in trouble, okay? Uh, am I long or short? I forget. Short. Uh, I'm short because I got a short-term sales signal. Very short term, okay? But if you back the chart out a little bit, you can see that so far the uptrend remains intact, but it could be in trouble here over the short term. So, yeah, if you're trading short term, absolutely. It's okay. Not okay, but I, I, I hear you. FXE is a euro. FXE, so Euro. The Euro looks like it's making a long-term bottom, but when you zoom in a little bit, you can see that it's it's definitely rolled back over and bow tied down. Uh, not off of major, major highs. Again, that's a minor sell signal. Anything that happens kind of mid-range in here, that's only multi-year highs. But the Euro looks like it could be in trouble. Might as well look at the dollar while we're at it. Dollar, I still think, is in trouble. I think shorter term, it's it's had a nice little run in here. From lows and shorter term, you got a short term intermediate, uh, a, a minor, I should say, bow tie buy because it's just coming off a of multi uh, year highs. This would be your major bow tie sell back here. Let's take a little weekly on that. 
Um, weekly dollar, you got your bow tie in here. So, so longer term, the dollar has topped. Okay, in here, shorter term looks like it's in on a bit of a retrace, a bit of a bounce. The yen looks like the gold chart. I could. Which one's the yen again? FXE, FXE. I forget. FXE is a euro. VIX, VIX. Um, let's just look at the VIX, VIX. The VIX does not really adhere to technical analysis unless you're using uh, reversion to the mean. The VIX only matters when it matters. Years ago, I was kind of enamored with the VIX. Um, Larry Connors wrote a lot of VIX systems. In fact, one of my VIX systems, I think, made it in one or two of my VIX systems that I developed, co-developed, I guess, with him, made it into his book along with mine. Um, I don't see a whole lot to gleam off the VIX right now, just kind of sideways in here. Um, it, it, you got to remember with the VIX, it's a it's a volatility measurement, not so much a, a market that trends. Okay, so volatility pretty low in here, but not really stretched. If it begins to get stretched, what's a longer term moving average doing there? Let's take a look at that. It's something I haven't really played with much, but let's just do that. Uh, let's take a look. That's a 50, so it's not stretched from the 50. Let's take a look at the 100. Not really stretched from 100, 200. It stretched a little bit from the 200-day moving average. So volatility is lower than normal, fairly low. So at some point, we could see a pretty serious expansion of volatility. In fact, VIX at 14, I remember, shoot, that was in the late uh, 90s before everything went crazy. We had a VIX way down in the 14s, and we never saw 14s for a long, long time. Um, but, yeah, I don't think there's anything to gleam off the VIX other than volatility has been low expect the expansion at some point Otis says Raven mom has held five years okay well I don't want to get into your uh, your mom's position she's holding it well looks like it's going up at least now I mean but uh, five years that's a long time to hold something that's uh, headed lower let's see this is what 2013, five years is what, uh, 2011, it was 2011. Whenever you get into stock, make sure you have a, a plan in place. And obviously this one has gone down considerably. So yeah, whatever you're, um, I, I certainly wouldn't hold on to the stock if it took out the, its old lows in here, but you know, I'm a trend guy, so maybe she has different reasons. HV is very low in the currency ETF, so you trade these in Forex. Yeah, 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 Donald. Uh, the HV is very low in the currency ETFs because it's just kind of like measuring the the actual move in the in the actual currencies. If you were trading them through Forex, you have some leverage involved, and that's why the volatility seems so much greater than in these uh, currency ETFs. Um, I'm not a huge fan of trading efficient markets. But they can be, they can offer some opportunities here and there. And also, they're obviously super easy to get in and out of. And you could actually, I'm not a big fan of day trading either, but I do intraday position trading, I guess you'd call it, uh, off of, um, like 60 minute bow ties and things like that in currencies. I don't want to dig, dig that hole too deep. FXY is the yen. Okay. The point was that FXY looks like gold. Let's see what that looks like. Well, a little bit. There might be a reasoning for that. I don't know if there is. Um, what we could do just for S and G's is we can we can overlay the gold on that. Uh, let's see. It's been a while. It's a comparison symbol. We'll put gold on top. We should make gold gold. And let's see. Comparison symbol. It won't let me do it for some. Oh, here we go. We could put gold in there, G, L, D. Let's make gold, gold, and then the stock green, I guess. Comparison color. Gold would be gold. And why is that not working? G, L, D. Oh, here we go. Comparison visible. All right, that's gold. And then we'll change the price of the, of the yen 
to um, how about green? Okay. So Andre's point is that the gold, I think it was Andre, he says gold and a yen look a lot alike, and they do. Um, but you can see that they, they certainly diverge at, at times. Now keep in mind the scaling is, is not necessarily exact on this because um, it just doesn't work that way. This just gives you a reference. It's pretty good like um, – you could put the. I used to put the sub industry under my chart so I could look at it, but now since I look at the sub industry in there anyway, I don't bother. But yeah, they might be. There might be something there. Uh, I don't know why. If some, somebody in here knows if there's an intermarket technical analysis relationship, let me know. USO. Uh, now, what it could be is, uh, or part of it could be that the dollar. Commodities are dollar denominated, okay? So if the dollar goes lower, commodities go higher. So that inverse relationship may be playing itself out because of the dollar yen relationship. So how's that for an answer? That's, I'll stick with that for now. Um, it's kind of interesting that oil, everybody's been poo-pooing oil. And talking about how oil is headed lower and, and fundamental reasons uh, why oil should head lower. But what has oil done? Okay. As a general statement, it has worked its way higher. Let's get those moving averages back in there. Let's put a long-term moving average in here. See what's going on. By the way, somebody asked me recently. They said, hey, Dave, um, I'm seeing bow ties, but they're way – but but the, the stock – is way below the long-term moving average. It's like, well, that's fine. That's okay. Because a bow tie is a transitional pattern, and you're going to get a bow tie long before you're going to, you're going to get a crossing of what? The 200-day moving average. So here you have a 200-day moving average. Your bow tie was way back here, okay? So, yeah, that's normal for that to happen. But, yeah, oil is definitely in an uptrend. Uh, it's got a little overhead supply right here, but so far, so good. And I think that it could be the um, – we could be in a longer term bull market there. We'll see though. You know me, trend guy, one day at a time. BRSS is copper. Yeah, it's headed higher. It looks pretty good so far. Um, these commodities, keep in mind, these commodity ETFs can be a little choppier than regular stocks. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and buy it. Maybe if it broke out to new highs, next pullback. But yeah, absolutely in an uptrend. Can't argue with that. Thank you, Dave, for your help. This was great as always. Be safe and have a great holiday weekend. You too, Don. You're welcome, John. Uh, X for Andre. That's going to be a steel stock. U.S. Steel, I think. Um, I don't like the way it rolled back over in here. Shorter term, it's a bow tie. Again, as I said earlier, I don't trade these intermediate term bow ties or these uh, mid-level bow ties. So I would pass on that if it was um, if you were trading it. This was one that... Um, I put in my daughter's portfolio for the stock picking contest because it was making new highs back here. And then luckily the contest ended long before all these things crashed. Uh, one of my clients says, well, Dave, why don't we pretend we're in a stock picking contest and we just, we just kick ass and we make a lot of money and then, and then we stop and we go back to doing things regular way. Well, the problem is the timing could be abysmal in that. It just so happened that I hit it right um, with the commodities in my daughter's account. And then with uh, a, a friend of the family when, when I was in the stock picking contest with him um, and, and he did all the work. I just told him to buy stocks, make a new highs. And he happened to hit it right at that time too. And I forget what took off back then. It might've been the gold stocks on that first leg out way back then. And everybody else was getting crushed in regular stocks. HCLP, that's going to be a crush stock, a gold crush or a metal crush or something. Uh, high crush partners. It's a little wide and loose, but it looks like it's getting its act together, and it looks like it's really bottomed out in here. So not today, but if this thing can break out to new highs from these low levels, this is your this is um this is a poster child for a Phoenix stock. Keep an eye on this one longer term. That's a weekly chart. Uh, that's a weekly chart. Oh, by the way, look at the weekly bow tie back here. Look at that. That looks pretty good. Uh, it looks like it's bottoming out longer term. It could pro possibly make even a weekly bow tie. If this thing makes a weekly bow tie, 
I, I don't want to say load the boat, but I would certainly be very excited about it. But for now, see if it could break out to new highs if you're trading off the daily chart, which I recommend anyway. Thanks for all the great webinars, Dave. Oh, you're welcome, Heather. UUP, we talked about that one. That's a dollar, yeah. We think it's NGD. This could be a gold stock for Mr. Eric. NGD, I guess I better move the lightning round. Yeah, this one looks pretty good. Um, it, the only problem is is it, 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 these gold stocks are starting to, it's like they need pullbacks, but the problem is if they pull back too much, then they're back to their prior consolidation. So the fact that it's back to its prior consolidation, my initial my initial thinking when I first looked at this would be, yeah, this looks pretty good. But now that I'm kind of looking at it, you can see it's pulled back to its prior little breakout or actually below that. So I think it would pass on this one based on that. You're welcome, Angelo. NGD, we talked about that's a gold stock. INGN for Otis, did we talk about that one? Uh, yeah, I think we did, yeah, okay. XME, yeah, I've got a little problem with the XME because the thing about the XME, this is metals, okay? The XME pulled back to its prior little breakout level. Metals and mining from the Morningstar industry groups looks a little bit better, if I could find them. There they are. They look a little bit better than the XME. And they are kind of coming out of the pullback, but they shouldn't pull back much further. Otherwise, they could be in trouble, or I should say if they pull back much further. The XME, for whatever reason, looks a little worse. Um, it did pull back to its prior little little breakout here. So far, it's trying to rally up. A little bit of an opening gap reversal today, though, so I'd like to see some follow-through there before uh, getting too, too excited. I think the uptrend's still intact, but it certainly lost some steam. Otis says, you're a good teacher and an honest man. Dave, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Well, you know, we all get our butt hands to us. If somebody says they don't, then, then why would they? <laughs> uh, anyway. That was just a it was just a study done on on someone who screams on TV and I thought it was kind of interesting so um, I don't want to get myself in trouble but <laughs> you guys could Google some of that and find some interesting things um yeah this made a bow tie way back here a little bit on the thin side uh, but I hear you it looks like a major bottoms in place but shorter term not so good so in a lot of these metals I think we're at a bit of an inflection point we're gonna have to wait for them to uh, to see if they could go on and make some new highs. So this stock right here would have to make a brand new high somewhere in here and then pull back for me to get excited about it. But good eye on that one. I think it's bottom. It's just uh, the timing. You have to wait on that. ACIA? Yeah, that's a new issue. Um, it's kind of interesting. This is one of the new issues that even though it's above, I have a rule that they have to be less than $20 a share before you play a certain breakout pattern. But this is one I've been watching and I find it fascinating that it, it, it didn't adhere to that $20 rule and it's done really well so far. Um, I think is, is the, uh, I think the, uh, the IPO course, I think it might be on sale right now. Let me check that real quick. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty cheap too, as far as price is concerned. Let me th let me just see. I think if you put in 200 off, speaking of IPOs, I think it's one of those unadvertised things right here. IPOs. I think we talked about that in last week's thing. Start trading IPOs. By the way, there's a one-hour video on this page. It's pretty good, if I say so myself. Check it out. It's uh, DaveLander.com/trade. T-R-A-D-E IPOs. And let me see if we've got that promo in place. If not, I'll put it uh, I'll put it on over the weekend. 200 OFF apply. Did it work? Nope. Okay. Well, I have to. I'll do that over the weekend. I'll put that on sale. Gold's too much short-term overhead supply. Pullback not deep enough. Uh. It depends on the individual stock. Um, yeah, like we said, gold itself looking a little questionable in here. Uh, VEDL. Yeah, uh, this would have to make new highs. It's just so many days to the pullback in here. It would have to make new highs and then pull back. Yeah, we just talked about this one. 
everything I just said. Okay, Eric, that's one on the list today. Let's stay off of that one for today. Okay, it looks like we're out of time. Uh, you're welcome, John. John says, uh, another great enlightening session. Have a great morning weekend. You too, John. Uh, thank you, Jill. Jill says, great as usual. So glad I found you. Well, I'm glad you found me too. Thanks, Dave. From Aaron, uh, my friend over there nearby Jackson, Mississippi. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, let me go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, any unanswered questions, you do routine, daviddavelander.com. I will be checking in this weekend, so feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, and if not, I hope to see everybody next week. All you guys and girls have a fantastic Memorial Day weekend. And uh, be safe and have fun. If you could do both of those at the same time, that would be awesome. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys uh, next week. Thank you guys so much.